we can move on to the DOC report on correctional staff. We have um, three people from corrections, um, starting with the uh, commissioner, um, speaking to us from the hamlet of Arlington, um, Vermont. Uh, so go ahead, Commissioner. Good morning, Senator. By the way, I had a nice conversation through emails with uh, the owner of the facility you're using. I, I heard that. And he, heard. And he uh, yeah. We, uh, we have some interesting conversations here, Senator, as you can imagine. Sure. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, for the record, my name is Jim Baker, the Commissioner of Corrections, and uh, I have with me uh, Al Cormier, uh, the Chief of Operations and Heather Simon, who is the uh, director of the Office of Professional Standards. So um, I, I guess, Senator, you would like me just to report out on our report that we, we have uh, filed with um, the committee yes. on, the, uh, on the 30 additional positions. So we, we, we did provide you with that report <clears throat> and um, where we stand um, as of the filing of the report um, and, and these numbers may be off by one or two. Um, we currently have 73 vacancies uh, in our security staff. Those are the correctional <laughs> officer ones. Um, those include the 30 positions that we're talking about um, that were authorized under Act 74 in 2019. And so um, taking away those 30 um, additional positions, um, we have 43 vacancies in, the, in that position of corrections officer one. I think that is probably um, as good as it's been in the last couple of years. When I got here last year, um, we, we were in the high 90s, low 100s. Um, so um, COVID has definitely had an effect on our ability to recruit. Um, we were in early 2020 doing a lot of in-person recruiting with our recruiting and hiring staff um, that were that was created just prior to me getting to corrections. Um, that's been cut down now. Um, we, we are doing some virtual stuff, but um, we're limited in our ability to get out to college campuses and other locations to do in-person recruiting, which was a big part of our strategy. Also, because of COVID, um, we have run four classes since April and we've hired 84 officers since April. Um, but our classes are much smaller because of COVID, social distancing, and taking the precautions that we need to take um, as far as um, keeping the classroom safe. And we've condensed the class down um, where we go 17 days straight instead of running it over five weeks. Um, we're, we're getting the majority of what we need in, uh, and then some of the other um, training is done on site at the facilities when the corrections officers get back there. Um, one of the things that I've discovered since I've been here and we're really taking a look at, I know there was a lot of conversation when I first came on in January around um, our ability to recruit. To be quite honest with you, we don't have a challenge. We don't have a problem with recruiting. Our issue is in retention. So if you look back over the last two years, um, We've hired 249 corrections officer ones, and um, and and, there, and we lost 116 of those um, in two years. That's a 50 54 percent um, retention rate. Now since April, we fired 84 and 20. We've lost, and that's a, that's about a 76 percent retention rate. And why is there there a difference in that small window? is because we're spending a lot of time focusing on better hires, uh, more focused on retaining people, and we're continuing to do that by gathering data right now. I will also say when we lose people in those stages of a year, two years, um, sometimes it's just not the right fit. And it's, it's good for the person and good for us that, that they move on. But we need to do a better job in retention. And um, we, we are close to, um, executing our plan of um, a new hiring process. Um, we have another class that's scheduled to start at this point on November 30th. 
um, the way the virus is going right now, I'm hoping we can still have that class. And uh, right now we have 13 folks lined up for that class. So we continue to chip away at those vacancy numbers. And uh, after this next class, we will be going to um, the, the, a new hiring plan, which I've talked about at committee uh, testimony prior um, around um, doing a better job on backgrounds, hiring process, standardizing the interview process, and also building equity, fairness, and impartiality into that process. Um, we've been working with consultants to help us um, develop a, a, a standard of questioning and evaluation um, that doesn't allow bias or prejudice to sneak into the system. So that's an overview of the report, and uh, I'm certainly uh, willing to answer any questions um, um, that members may have. but I'm sure there's a number of questions. Um, Commissioner, uh, as, you know, obviously COVID has just um, in many states decimated the correction system, um, both staff and inmates. And in-state, not, not Mississippi, but in-state, you have been fairly successful at um, dealing with it and, and I saw statistics from other states that's something your staff should be proud of and you should be proud of but I'm curious if um, the staff is does the staff hear that uh, how appreciative we all are um, not this just this committee but that the commissioner deputies and etc are all appreciative of their efforts I just need to say that because I think it's important that we get that back to the staff. Yeah, so Without I those line officers, we could be in real trouble, like yeah, other listen, states are. Listen, the security staff is taking the brunt of this um, because of constant testing. Um, we, you know, and I don't want to get ahead of my skis here, but you know, we got some pretty sobering news this morning on testing of the general population overnight. And I don't wanna get ahead of my skis here. Um, we have at least two situations, if not three that we're monitoring right now. We had a staff member test positive in St. Johnsbury as a result of the mass testing on Monday. It's one of the, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a staff member. And again, I don't wanna give too much information just to be protective of HIPAA. And the contact tracing leaves me a little concerned. Um, we're monitoring a couple other situations in the state. Look, the increase in the community spread right now is going to impact our facilities. And the staff, you take St. Johnsbury, for example, Senator, to your point. This was the third week in a row that they tested. And they're probably going to have to test again because of this positive test. And, you know, it, it's trying on them. And so what I try to do is uh, I make personal phone calls to staff and thank them. And uh, I just yesterday, for example, sent an email. I, I, we crafted an email yesterday that went out this morning, recognizing the stress and the challenges that the St. Johnsbury staff has right now. And we do that as often as we can, um, but to, to not acknowledge the fact that staff is frustrated, would, I wouldn't be candid with you. They're frustrated. Uh, I, it would not hurt for I guess Representative Eminem's and I, on behalf of the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, yes, sent a letter thanking the line staff. Um, Brian, if you could prepare something like that for us. Yeah. And what I will do with that, Senator, is once I get that from you, I will send that out um, in, a, in, a, in a statewide message. And the other thing we do. Um, I'll and I'd be happy to hear from any committee members who have things that they'd like added to it, but I just needed to. Um, we need to recognize the work that they're doing. They've done incredible work, Senator. This is just, you know, and again, we're gearing, it's all hands on deck again. Um, it's, uh, we're heading back to the preparation, the execution that we were doing in April and May. Um, I'm very concerned about the facilities, the staff, uh, and the inmates that we have an obligation to protect. Um, there were pictures 
I hate to even bring this up at the same time as we're talking about thanking them. There were pictures on Facebook of corrections officers in garbage bags. Um, can you comment a little on that? Sure. Whether we were requiring them to wear garbage bags? I, I think, Senator, that uh, if anybody's, um, that, that's a nice, you know, I'm, I'm going to be very candid because you've all known me to be very candid. That's a very catchy term and it sounds pretty bad. Um, but but uh, uh, I think if I shared with you the photographs and I'm more than happy, um, yes, the gar they, are, they are made out of garbage bags. But um, as the commissioner with an obligation to protect inmates and staff, when I can't get my hands on PPE to protect the staff and an inmate comes up with an idea and creates a pattern to take garbage bag and create plastic gowns out of them, um, that's what we had to do. Now, um, I get a lot of heat. Um, I think you know this. I, I get a lot of pushback from the union. I mean, it sounds really good when somebody sends a notice to you and or other pe people saying that staff is required to wear garbage bags. I mean, I don't think that's a, uh, I don't think that's a real um, honest description of what those are. Um, they, they are cut and made and produced by the inmates. Um, I've actually talked to the inmates and thanked them for their service. And um, we, we, have, we have a hospital in Springfield that would love to take as many of those they can get. And we've really? been providing the hospital with those so-called garbage bags. And they seem to be fairly happy with them because they're protecting their staff. So uh, it is, it, it is a, I, I got to be candid here. It's a little bit of a sore point with me. And somebody describes those as garbage bags. Senator Hooker, did you have no. a I, I appreciate Thank you for the that. creativity. Yeah. I appreciate the creativity in, in the uh, the uh, coming up of PPE because I know I think that it's probably going to be a problem again and we need to address that. My question though is um, have there been individuals brought back from out of state recently? We, we have we have a trip of uh, either nine or ten. Um, Chief Cormier, are you there? It's is it ten that's coming back? Right now, we're we're scheduled to bring nine back next nine back. Or next week. Next week, Senator. So and they're being, is this they're being is, tested? Go ahead. Oh, okay, I was going. Is this going to be affected by the new universal um, ban on you know transportation ban or? They will, they will be tested in Mississippi before they come back. Yeah. The, Mississippi, the Mississippi staff and inmates are being tested next week. Next I have week. Representative Hooper and then Representative Shaw. And they'll be quarantined when they get back, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, add my appreciation you to the chorus. Thank you very much. I am curious if the um, if you still have mandatory overtime requirements and what sort of shifts um, COs are having to work. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, the, the overtime is still um, mandatory overtime is being um, um, forced upon employees to cover shifts. Um, and again, some of it, there's various reasons for it. Um, we had a positive test at St. Johnsbury two weeks ago of a staff member. Um, when we did the contact tracing, 14 staff members had to be put out on quarantine for 14 days. So obviously that's going to drive the overtime. Um, you know, as we try to get these staffing levels up, I'm hoping it's going to start impacting the overtime. And um, I, I talk to staff often personally, and I hear the challenges. I've actually heard from some spouses about the challenges of working mandatory overtime. And that goes back to representative to my comment to Senator Sears about um, these folks are under enormous stress right now. We're trying to manage it the best we can. What number of hires will you need to do in order to avoid having, I mean, there's always going to be overtime requests, but Correct. to kind of get over the hump that you're experiencing now. I think we have to get as close as we can to those 76 vacancies and we got to get through this COVID challenge. So we don't have staff going out and being quarantined. Um, so the closer we get to the 76, as the population goes down, um, 
that also plays into our ability to potentially collapse some post inside facilities as the population goes down. And um, that should have an impact as well. Today, we're at 1,363 folks uh, in our custody um, to include um, the 204 that are in Mississippi. And if we bring the nine back, obviously, um, that drops us down to 195 in Mississippi. So good news to be below. Representative Shaw, then Senator Lyons. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, what does the, uh, the facility at St. Johnsbury look like now? Is that still being used as a quarantine uh, facility or have you opened that back up to more normal operations? It's back at normal operations, but right now because of the positive test, it's in lockdown. Okay, and so those folks that are coming back, where will they be quarantined? They'll be quarantined in Rutland, where, where our standard quarantine for them to come back is quarantine. Thank you. You're Thanks. Representative Senator Lyons is next. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Commissioner. Thank you for your work. And I concur with the support that we should send out to all the frontline folks. This is really critical. Um, is there any um, concern that we should have regarding the women's correctional facility in Chittenden County. I know Chittenden County's had a, a huge number uh, recently. And if there's any link with that, you mentioned St. Johnsbury, but not other areas. Um, you, you mean as far as, as far as being oh, exposed to cult, cult? Yeah. Well, listen, um, yes, because what we do is we pay attention to what the, what the uh, reports are around the facility in the community. And so, you know, Washington County right now um, is, is a challenge. So we watch that stuff um, all the time as far as what the outbreak is. And so it is a concern. And, um, you know, we are watching one situation with an employee there. Um, and, and we should know um, soon about a test coming back with that employee, where that employee stands. All right, thank you. And then one last comment on, on the garbage bags. I, it's good enough when we go hiking and it's good enough when we're at sporting events. So um, it's a creative uh, solution. Well, I appreciate that, Senator. And again, look, I'm not downplaying the fact that we had to make PPE out of garbage bags. I'm simply saying that the describing that we're forcing people to wear garbage bags is not exactly uh, um, I, I'd be more than happy at some point to share with the community the photographs of the production line with the inmates. And I've talked to those inmates directly and uh, provided them with a little bit of a pizza party to, to express my appreciation for what they're doing. Well, uh, thank, you. thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Is that, uh, helpful? As we get questions about it from uh, I understand, Senator. constituents. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Mr. Komeyer or uh, Ms. Zimmons have anything to add to the commission's report. You're both scheduled um, to speak. Uh, Heather, do you have anything? And Alan? Good morning. No, I have nothing to add. Good to see well, you Well, maybe you could add a little bit about what, what's going on in the professional standards effort to upgrade corrections officers and others. With regards to training? Yeah. Well, training, as you know, is really challenging right now. So we focus on the core competencies and the competencies that our officers need to get into the facility. Everything else is done remotely. So those 17 days that the commissioner referred to are the basics with regards to security and operations, um, as well as um, classification, legal, uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, all of the topics with regards to support coordination, employee rights, harassment, misconduct, et cetera. And that uh, schedule is pretty aggressive for the recruits. Um, the staff is reduced to two or three trainers in the building at a time with social distancing six feet or more. Um, they train all day and they, uh, they're given an hour break in the afternoon right around four o'clock 
um, and then they go again in the evening. And the idea is that there's less foot traffic in the building, uh, less contact with too many instructors. So we work off a core group. Um, they, um, we build in one day off for the recruits in that 17 days. I don't know that we've always used it though. We pretty, we pretty much measure it around uh, fatigue, et cetera. Most of those recruits will stay in town at the hotel and just use that time as rest and for studying. And that's where we're really focusing our training efforts right now. There's been a lot of additional content added with regards to COVID um, and uh, PPE, et cetera, so that they all know, know how to use that. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Al, any particular comments on what's happening? I can just refer to, uh, to Senator Lyon's question about Chinden. And we just got off a meeting with the Department of Health, and we are looking at testing Chinden in two weeks. We'll, we'll be testing that entire facility um, because of that concern that the commissioner raised um, and Springfield facility as well. So we're hoping to do two facilities next week, St. Johnsbury and Springfield, and then Chinden the following week. So we are we are in discussions of, of increasing our testing across all of our facilities for our staff because of the concerns in the community right now. Yeah, that does lead one specific question about COVID in Mississippi and the outbreak there and how that's been, is it, is it being resolved? Is it still a large percentage? So right, right, go ahead, go ahead, Al. Go ahead, Al. Uh, right, right now we have no positive inmates in Mississippi. Um, they've all recovered. Um, we have testing again next week, as the commissioner said. The inmates that are returning are quarantined for two weeks prior to leaving Mississippi, and then they'll be quarantined for two weeks when they mm -hmm. return. Um, but we, we've got ongoing testing there. Staff testing at that facility is scheduled for next week. Um, but again, we're we're negative across the board with Vermont. Were, were there any medical issues that came up as a result? I know some people have heart issues and other issues that on the ballot. We, yeah, we, we had one elderly individual that, that had some pre-existing conditions that, that spent a few nights in the emergency room um, in the hospital. And, uh, but he's, he's recovered doing well. We don't have any of our population in the infirmary down there right now. Um, that population has done, done well with it. Of the recovery. Good. Question. Senator, the other thing I would add to this is that we now have control of camera systems. We're watching the facility remotely on a regular basis. Uh, we can watch that remotely and we have staff watching to make sure that protocols are being followed on a regular basis. And if we see that they're not, um, the out-of-state unit is on the phone immediately with um, the folks in Mississippi. So we have that access now that gives us uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, value in understanding if protocols are being followed or not. <clears throat> That's very helpful. Senator Hooker, you had a question? Just a quick question. Um, Commissioner, what does, you mentioned that the facility in St. Johnsbury is in lockdown. What does that look like for staff? Now, you, you're, you're going to be all the better. I think, Senator, if you don't mind, I'm going to no, talk about ahead. that because he, uh, he could describe it better than me. Okay. So a, a full lockdown is, is absolutely no movement whatsoever throughout the, for the inmate population. Um, that requires medication being dispersed in the, in the units, um, food being dispersed in the units, no movement to uh, any recreational activities, anything like that. So a full lockdown is, is no movement within the facility. Um, but what does it mean for staff coming in and out? So for, for staff, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the staff because it's all within the, the secure perimeter of the facility. So they still need to go to their, their posts. They still need to check the population. They still need to do their rounds. There's still um, responsibilities that they have to meet. So the staff are still coming in and out. It just it reduces the movement of the inmate population in our efforts to mitigate the spread of the virus. Um, okay, and is, is the staff checked daily, you know, at you know, each shift? Yep, temperature. Well, yeah. So they their um, self assessment before they come in with uh, temperature checks, symptoms checks. There's a questionnaire. Um, 
same, same thing you'd be asked if you went to a doctor's office. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions regarding the um, corrections issues and uh, particularly the staffing? Been very helpful, uh, appreciate it. Um, now we have a report on the one-time COVID relief funds from Commissioner Baker and Matt uh, Diaz Dano. I never pronounce his name right, so Matt. Uh, Senator, that's why we refer to him as Matt D. It makes it a lot easier. <laughs> thank you. Before we move on to that, I want to thank all of you for those kind words and support of staff. Um, we'll make sure that that word gets out. And I think the other Senator Hooker's comments about um, what it looks like for lockdown. You know, I have to give a shout out to the inmates as well. At various times over the last four or five months, they've been in various stages of lockdown. And, um, you know, we had an incident um, a couple weeks ago where the corrections officer was being assaulted and um, eight inmates came, pulled her away from the individual assaulting her and restrained the individual until other staff got there. And I think it speaks to our staff and the way they interact with inmates. We hear about the bad stuff that happens with staff, but I have to say that that kind of stuff doesn't happen unless inmates feel like they're being valued, respected, and treated fairly. And uh, I just wanted to share that because the system doesn't work if the inmates are so stressed that they're restless. And to be locked down like that is not easy, but they accept it, they work with us, and. Uh, as the commissioner, I'm appreciative of that as well. And just if, if I could clear, clarify one more thing on the, the lockdown in St. Johnsbury, part of the meeting with VDH, our rapid response team meeting this morning, it was determined that we would go back to a modified lockdown, which allows for more movement. So that's that's been lifted through as results of the contact tracing and, and um, the efforts inside the facility to, again, help mitigate the, uh, the spread of that virus. Thank you. So, Senator, in respecting your time here, I took a little extra time. Um, I think Matt D is on now, and I'm going to have Matt D talk about the CRF funds from the financial standpoint. And yep. if there's questions on policy, um, I'll answer those questions for the committee. Thank you. Matt or your B. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so the department received two and a half million dollars, as you all know, of um, CARES Act funding for some specific purposes. Um, there were five different allocations of funding, and, and this report that we submitted uh, presents at least point in time where we are with, with these uh, initiatives. Um, if it's helpful, I can go through each one of them and, and tell you kind of what the, what the dollars spent or anticipated to be spent are at this point. Um, yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Seven hundred. Um, the report is uh, on our website. If people want to look at it on a different screen, um, it's, uh, it's called the uh, update on CARES Act funding, one-time funding. Go ahead, Matt. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So the the first <laughs> application is seven hundred sixty thousand dollars for temperature scanners and six full body scanners at the correctional facilities. Uh, the pro the um, Right, the status of that right now is that the X-ray body scanner, six of them have been ordered and we're anticipating delivery uh, various points all before December, <coughs> of course. Um, a lot of work going into setting those up and, and the staff will need to be trained for, for the use of those. Um, that will take that entire appropriation of $760,000 as well as some from the, uh, the next one we're gonna talk about. The, the total of the machines was approximately a million dollars. That includes some ongoing maintenance costs that wouldn't be paid, wouldn't be able to be paid out of the CARES Act funding, but specific to CARES Act funding, about 900,000 will be utilized for those. Um, I don't wanna glance over the temperature scanners. That was something we had talked about. Um, we, we do have temperature scanners, uh, temporal scanners for the for, um, field sites, for the facilities. We didn't go forward with the original initiative of um, purchasing basically the, um, the temperature scanners that are effectively a kiosk that you'd walk up to, uh, the, the, the cost benefit of those wasn't wasn't a great one. Uh, it still took a, a lot of staff time. Uh, it wouldn't have reduced anything really. It would have just been a, a cost incurred. Uh, so it was decided that what we were doing had previously been working and then not to move forward with those. Of course, the, the, the body scanners were a little bit more than we had initially anticipated, so.
are they the similar to the ones we get in the hospital or doctor's office when we walk in? You know, they, they press it, they put it, put it up to your forehead. And... Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So if there's no questions about the, the first, we'll, we can go into the technology upgrade section, the $700,000. Sure. Um, so as I, as I said, about 140, 150,000 of that 700 would be used for the remaining balance for the x-ray body scanners. Um, they haven't been paid for yet. They need to be received first. But like I said, they, they, they will be uh, in time to, to do this with, with the CARES Act funding. Um, we've also started the process and I should say a lot of this, you know, it, we, we have the funding for this and these initiatives are, are great. The, the one challenge we have is that bringing technology in is, is difficult. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hurdles to get through. Um, we, it's not as simple as sometimes just going, in, going out and finding what we need and then buying it um, and, and bringing it in. So what's being worked on one of these initiatives is uh, WebEx video conferencing equipment. This would be uh, for inmates to receive evaluations through Department of Mental Health. There's, there's other video conferencing capabilities for these. Uh, so some of the funding will be used for those. Uh, we also have various remote access equipment needs for, for staff to be able to, to function remotely and, and also um, for staff who are interacting with the inmates to be able to, to do that over um, various technologies remotely. That's that the anticipated expense from that is about 300,000. So there, the likelihood is there will be, not the likelihood, the, 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 we will have funding remaining in this particular allocation. Um, some of the things we had looked at very early on, unfortunately, just aren't quite possible, particularly during the pandemic. Um, Wi-Fi in the facilities, um, doing the heat mapping that's required to do that, requires contractors to come in. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a large initiative, in both in terms of the, the cost of it, as well as the, the scope of the project, the, the time it would take, and the number of individuals that would have to come in to do this. It's just not something that's practical to be done, not safe to be done during this particular time period. Um, it is something that we're looking at for going forward, but unfortunately, no CARES Act funding would be able to be used, utilized for that, um, unless there's some type of time extension on it. But the likelihood is, even with time extension, still requires people in the building that may not be practical. We would, uh, uh, hopefully there'll be a second round and, uh, and hopefully um, there will be um, a change in, in some of the federal requirements on the current CARES Act funding. At least that's my hope. Go ahead. Thank you, Senator. Um, the third allocation was three hundred sixty-three thousand dollars. This is for both. Uh, this is for community justice centers. Two hundred fifty-two thousand specifically for direct costs incurred, and the remaining one hundred eleven thousand was to provide additional program capacity for the transitional housing programs that uh, a few of those uh, CJC partners have. Um, we have to date granted about two hundred thirty-six thousand dollars to the. 18 um, community justice centers. That includes the, the transitional housing programs. Um, candidly, I don't know that all of that's going to be spent. Um, it was what was requested, but there are some initiatives that I think similar to what we're seeing, our partners are also having some challenges in terms of timing and, and, and the funding. So if we're looking at a December, a December 30th deadline, it's more likely we might be a little bit under 200,000 than over 200,000 in terms of this particular allocation. Um, we've had many, many conversations with the uh, directors from the CJCs and other folks. They've worked tremendously hard on this. Uh, I think, you know, when we talked previously, um, there was some concern about the ability to, for these, these partners, for the grantees to, to receive funding. Um, they've looked at every legitimate expense that they could, they could claim as uh, COVID eligible. They've been very creative with those things. There just simply isn't, it's, it's a combination of time and just not enough expenses to, to utilize that. So we will probably be somewhere in the um, hundreds, $150,000 um, in terms of surplus in that particular okay. allocation. Does that move us to D, the 
yes, thank you. Um, so that the $350,000, this was to increase rental housing and supporting program capacity in the community. It was also for um, increasing, I'm sorry, pr providing domestic violence and batter intervention programs in the community. So the, I'll talk about the rental housing piece first. There has not been, um, a great ability to increase that. And there, there's a number of reasons for it. Timing, timing is probably the, 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 the primary one here in that the funding goes through December 30th and, and many of the increases that have been looked at would require long-term leases that, go, that extend well beyond. And because there aren't funds, there aren't specific funds beyond December 30th, there hasn't been an ability for the providers and, and our partners to necessarily increase very much. Um, we have been able to utilize about 40,000 or will be able to use, utilize about 40,000 of that 200,000 that was estimated. We knew earlier on that this could be a challenge um, working with the Vermont Network uh, Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. The second piece of this, the, the remaining balance, uh, which was thought to be around 150,000 is actually greater than that um, for the batter intervention and other initiatives we've granted with, with the Vermont network. And we actually have from this allocation about $280,000 of the grant is, is going toward those domestic violence and batter intervention programs. So we, we weren't able to necessarily increase the rental housing at this particular stage, but we will utilize nearly all of this funding um, between the, the two um, uses that were intended, just more, more, more so in one than the other. Representative Hooper has a question. Thank you. I understand the challenge of um, obtaining transitional housing. Did, did you also, it was some of this funding <clears throat> used for kind of first and last on rent for individuals coming out and set up expenses? So you, you were creative in how you looked at this you didn't just look at how do we lease up space that can be used that's correct representative hooper yes and that that forty thousand dollars i spoke to thank you so that that is that's first and last they're just they're, the forty thousand will be utilized for the first and last month um the reason we, we just don't there, there needs to be eligible individuals to to utilize those funds for and and the number is, is right around where it typically would be for, for a fiscal year. Um, we had, I think when the numbers were, were estimated early on, the thought was that there may be an increase in the number of um, individuals that would be looking for those funds. And they're, they're, it's been fairly steady the last several months. Okay. I, in, in, in the hope that there'll be additional funds and more flexibility in how they're spent, um, perhaps one of the things that we can think about with CRF money is also how you put services or, you know, either through the CJCs or other kind of local partners or literally one-on-one -on, -one on folks who are coming out. So maybe the department can consider a different, your challenge is always who is appropriate to release. And so, a way of managing that could be also how you put additional services around people on the outside so you can move more folks out um, just going forward. Thank you. Representative, we have that we actually we have a working group going right now looking at housing and looking for what I refer to as that next generation of housing around um, folks that are challenged with you know um, mental health issues and or substance abuse issues. Um, so we get away from um, arrangements where um, reusing causes you to lose your housing. So we have yeah. we have a group looking at that now to identify what that housing should look like. Thank you. That's great to hear. And, and, and Senator Sears, if I can continue rather than raising my hand at another spot, um, I, I look forward to understanding how DOC can broadly support the partners in the community who are doing this work. I was asking my CJC about kind of what's been going on with them from a funding standpoint. And I'm told that their transitional grant funding 
has not been increased since I think they said uh, FY15. Um, and the resources that the base grants to the CJCs have been similarly held very static. I'm, I'm seeing just a, you know, over a ten, five, six year period, very minimal increases. And if we're serious about having a community partnership, then we need to provide those services to the community to be able to help with the partnership. So I, I hope you'll be sending us a budget that looks at how we do that. I, I appreciate that uh, representative, but it takes money for us to do that too. So, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> and uh, I think that's part of the conversation about the reinvestment piece, right? About the, the holistic look. And I think Matt's gonna get to the, either the next expenditure, I believe, talking about the work that we're doing with um, the National Network for Safe Communities, where we'll start um, engaging those partners to include the CJCs uh, in a more holistic approach to how we're going to manage that. Um, and, and I think um, as part of reinvestment too, um, your point is well taken. And I think that's where some of the reinvestment needs to occur. occur. Okay, moving right along. Matt, are you ready on them? Kind of discuss the network. We did, and yes, this this final allocation that that entire three hundred twenty seven thousand dollars has been granted to the network for uh, both the uh, needs for the domestic uh, domestic violence offender accountability programs across the state, as well as for. Um, funding that will go to them contract the network contracting to um, support incarcerated women being released from Chittenden and secure stable housing, ensure immediate needs are met, clothing, food, et cetera. Um, and finally, you have 600,000 for necessary changes in community support. Yes, and these are the funds that the Commissioner Baker was just speaking about. Uh, that we're going, that we're, we we contract we're contracting with the National Network of Safe Communities to begin an um, intimate partner violence intervention program, um, focused deterrence, as we've called it. Um, the CARES Act funding for this sets us up for qualitative and quantitative analysis at the the early stages for for the National Network to come in and, and basically set up a framework for this. Um, what it what the funds the CARES Act funding doesn't do is the work beyond that. So the framework gets built with these funds, and unless there's an extension or some additional funding that can be used for utilized for this purpose, uh, this is where we moving forward. You know, a two to three year initiative likely um, there there aren't necessarily base funds for these for this initiative, um, and then the thought is that with with the um, justice reinvestment money is that, that that this would be an important tie into a lot of the the other work that's being done. I'm sure the commissioner's already spoken to and, and can speak more to planning for that. Mm -hmm. Good questions comments. Great. Um, I think what we're going to do um, is thank you all very much. And knowing the committee has to get back together at twelve thirty for a meeting on Woodside or what to do when obviously it's closed. The future of uh, delinquents and youth uh, who are under DLC and how we're gonna deal with them under DCF and DLC. Um, we have a number of witnesses scheduled. Um, so uh, if everybody can be back at 1230 and if you would instruct us, Peggy, how to say goodbye early. Yep, if everyone could just mute themselves and shut their video off, I'll put the break sign up and then we'll come back at 1230. That worked. Any final comments from anybody? Thanks very much all. Thank you, thank you folks.